Oh, I found myself uh, searching for material uh, to use in videos, and before you know it, I was going way, way, way back three months ago, even up to three years ago, realized I hadn't responded to some of your comments. So today and next week, there are a couple short ones that are um, to specific points. So I hope I hope uh, those of you who who wrote in weren't discouraged by my by my slow progress getting to him. But I want to thank first Stephen uh, J and uh, Benjamin C uh, for your recurring donations. Very nice. Thank you very much. I think I referred to you in the last video and uh, didn't get names out there. So, all right. So let's go. Let's have a look at this question and see where it takes us. It isn't coffee today. It's hot and dry one up here in northern New Hampshire. I think we're around 90 today. And uh, I'm thirsty. This is music, says. And I like this question. I like the way it's phrased. I like the thoughtfulness of it. Uh, but, um, and always whenever I take these questions, remember I'm, I may simply be taking off from your point. Uh, a lot of times you put a thing in such a way that I can't simply say yes or no or anything like that uh, and just simply have to beat around the bush talking about the way we think about similar things. So you see that the uh, title for today is Naming the Pigs. Well, maybe it's called Naming the Pigs if my <laughs> if my Mr. Producer didn't think better of that. Um, here's uh, This is Music. I see how a technique of painting without naming the things the painter is painting, makes the skill a solitary one, because language and naming things gets us what we want in the social realm, but not in that realm, which is more private in the case of painting. Uh, let me just pause there, and that's what I'm going to do through this one today. I don't know if I even have any images for it. I think I don't, so I hope you can bear with me. Um, naming the things that a painter is painting, as you know, hearing me speak before, is... Um, uh, you know, shall we say forbidden? It goes against the idea of the um, of the naive eye. <clears throat> the uh, naive eye. On the other hand, I tell you to name the pigs. You have to name the pigs. So naming the thing, the object, and uh, many other things may or may I mean, is is we find frankly problematical because of the content of uh, the associations, the assumptions, presumptions that get affiliated with names of things. And then you also wind up with things like the ambition to make it really look like that and all that sort of thing, which we have, by the way, in any case. <laughs> it's the beauty of what we're doing. While we don't want to, while we don't want, while we want to maintain the naive eye, the naive eye, though, by definition, means the eye that doesn't know what it's painting. And uh, as Ma as Monet would say, it's an oblong of yellow here, uh, 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 whatever, a square of uh, of pink over there. That's what we're doing. But we still are naming. We're, what's the value of something? You know, what's the location of it? These are things that are all part of the word thought of us. Now, one thing I have said before, is that is when you're painting, don't try to name the color. So you can say more red, yellow, and blue when you're trying to correct a color. But I found it's always problematical to, to for example, you're painting a color. Don't say that's burnt sienna. <laughs> it won't help. You will, you'll actually mess yourself up. But try to hit the note without words. You follow me? wordlessly hit the note, just what you're seeing. And then and next week's all going to be about how to do that in the sense of getting concepts and things like that. Um, but just try to hit the note and then looking at the note in the context of the world you have, ask whether it should be more red, yellow, or blue rather than giving it a name of one of those colors. Oh, ultramarine. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. Don't do that. Context is so much everything. So you may think a color looks like ultramarine, but it frequently will look like it because of the associations around it. So if you get that, but I just want to clarify that what we mean by naming in this way is naming objects and then naming, in this case, you know, certain colors specific uh, and saying you're trying to reach one, but the idea of, of, of burnt sienna is in your head. So I don't want to be taking anything out of my head. I tell students to think with what's in front of them. So keep it's all that's in front of you. And I even tell students to get your palette out in front of you because you're painting out in front of you. Get your model out in front of you. Keep it all out here. 
So there's no temptation to go behind yourself, behind your eyes, back into your ears or whatever people have already told you, right? All right. I don't know what you mean exactly. Yeah, this is music by, uh, I'll have to call you Tim. This is music. I'll call you Tim. <laughs> you're, probably, you're probably a beautiful young lady. I, well, anyway. All right. Um, and I wonder if that's just one method. Now, this is the, really the kind of the trigger here. I wonder if that is just one method, this idea of not naming, you know, and avoiding the naming, uh, or the very best so far to represent the best parts of what the artist sees. Well, yeah, it, 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 it cl absolutely is just one method, right? And what we're talking about persistently is, is best practices, but to do what? So what are the best methods? What are the best mindsets? What are the best ways of thinking to, to, to reproduce the visual impression in front of you? What is that best method? Yes, that's consistently changed throughout history. People have gotten better and better at things as they, as they, as they looked at nature more. I mean, the thing that da Vinci starts is he starts people looking. And then, of course, this whole thing about the science of appearances then shows up, right? And he's really the beginning of that, the science of appearances. He says, don't you see what happens with this, what happens with that? Uh, all right. So, and I wonder if that's just one method or it's the best, uh, or, or best so far. We always assume it's the best so far. Um, although I don't know, represents the best parts of what the artist sees. I don't, I can't tell you I follow that precisely. So life and actions may be evolving so that one very good tool of today may become obsolete tomorrow when better tools and techniques are discovered. That's very much the point. And that's why I say, by the time you get to Degas, all of a sudden, everything's changing. I mean, best practices, everybody. Let's, <laughs> everybody except those guys that were raised in the academy per se. Uh, were switching. Everybody was switching because best to paint from life, you know, and a lot of plein air painting was going on. You're talking about the Monet era and so on. And so when, so when it began to be about painting from life, painting what you see, that's when best practices shifted to uh, and became, and, you know, began to follow what Velasquez was doing, you know, that portrait painter. Uh, and, and his best practices began to be um, uh, considered and uh, look and his ways of seeing um, uh, based, you know, which is about the content of the eye. It, it very clearly changes from outline to, into modeling to the content of the eye. So um, let's see what your next point is. And I also wonder about clearing the mind of ideas or the memory while painting. If that's just a sort of technique that works best for you, or if others have other techniques aside from clearing the mind, which works for them, just as well to produce paintings with the same effect. The, um, that's just the point about the best practices. Uh, and I can only tell you that for me, coming through, I was, I was a, I've shown you, I possibly should show you tonight, but I've shown you the plausible work I did in the YAML model, which was the, um, the, the red teapot you can see on the website, on the, on the, YouTube, on the uh, Facebook site. But, um, or on the web, yeah, on our, or on our website. But um, I've moved from that because of the inefficiencies and inconsistencies with the visual impression. And so there was a there was a strong likeness there, but there was also a diminished likeness. Something you can get you can get you can, there are things you can do better. For example, when you're working all over the place at once, it's not object by object by object by object. So. That's a question for you to answer in your own work. Are there best? Are there better ways? If you're trying to achieve the same thing, so if you're trying to achieve uh, the 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 truth and the beauty and the impact and the feeling of the impression <laughs> right in front of you, are there best practices, or are there multiples? Um, I, I'm I'm here to argue that there aren't multiples. There are best practices, but you 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 will have to sort it out for yourself. But you're, you, if, you if you're an illustrator, you won't conclude that my practices are best practices for you. You won't conclude that automatically. If you're an imaginative painter, you won't conclude that automatically. Sargent was able to, with, with this way of working, with a, a painterly visual order way of working, to produce imaginative work. But you know, that, that's a question for you to decide. That's the one area where conceivably the other method 
is just as good, okay? Uh, but it's still, so much of it depends on what your point is, what you're trying to achieve with it. Now, what I wanted to talk about, I'm, I'm actually holding in my hand the, uh, the, uh, Mel, the uh, Max Meldrum book, and uh, I'm going to just simply right now tell you that it's available through us. My people, Ron, Ron Toto just bought it, uh, uh, Sean and, and, and he just, uh, in the studio, just uh, Xeroxed it, like you're seeing here. It's, it's a photograph of Xerox. And they did every page, and the book is out there, and it's available through us if you want it. Uh, we aren't charging for it. Uh, I don't think I've ever charged for a book here. When I, pay, when I make my own book, I'm hoping that I can charge for that. The, uh, and I, for all you guys who are wondering when the heck I'm going to produce that, yeah, you can keep wondering, so am I. But the, I'm talking about the book about the Boston School. But I want you to understand this thought process, um, uh, T-I-M, T -T <laughs> and see if you can follow, this is music, uh, see if you can follow why it's plausible that this is best practices. But you can see what this guy's thinking is in discussing this. And Meldrum, uh, Max Meldrum is on exactly the same page as me, and I really recommend his book if, you're, if you want to understand the ideas associated with painting from the pure appearances. And that really does mean making sure your eyes aren't full of what you think it is. And this is the conversation that follows that. He talks about this specifically here. And of course, I've always talked about this as well. I'm actually not a student of his. I, I'm a uh, co-conspirator, I guess you could say, having found him very late this last couple of years. So here he is speaking, and it says, in any depictive exper experiment, visual phenomena analyzed and laid down in this objective manner ultimately reveals perceptions and things, perceptions of things, right? Perceptions, that means the eye content of things. Unfortunately, in this development, a formidable difficulty lies in wait for the tyro. And we're, this is what we're gonna be talking about, what the benefit is of staying in the, what he calls the virginal eye, right? Only too often, students and artists are heard complaining that the wonderful and convincing start they, they, they made had for some mysterious reason suddenly become graphically incoherent. I'm that guy. Way back when, that's one of the reasons I changed practices. I didn't, I didn't try to, I stopped trying to combine two practices. The reason for this collapse is, real, is, is easily explained. When a painter starts a picture he has in front of him, let me pause a second, not for you, I just to see if I can make this screen brighter for me. How much way down there? There we go, that'll be a big help. You're probably seeing it in my eyes now. Uh, only too often, uh, blah, 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 blah. The, the reason for this collapse is easily explained. When a painter starts a picture, he has in front of him his subject matter and a flat canvas, and it's clear that he can only start working by making patches of lights and darks, objective data. You see what I mean? The word objective data, not subjective data. Objective data. That's all you can paint with, by the way. I keep telling students, all you can paint with is the color sitting on your palette. <laughs> everything, the, everything in your eyes has to be red, yellow, or blue, darker, lighter, and located somewhere on the screen, right? Objective, visual, pure visual data. What can hit the retina is all you can, is all you have to work with. All right. His first brush marks. Oh, in reasoning this way, by the very nature of the circumstances, he's thinking as a painter. His first brush marks, as a consequence, inevitably bring about more resemblance between his canvas and subject. He's elated. Things are going well, and he proceeds to define and lay down further data. Now comes the difficulty. The valid facts on appearances, which as we have said, he's constrained to deal with, accumulate until they reach a stage where they provoke the realization of objects and things. From this point, he is unwittingly pulled into the realm of subjective perceptivity. And from his true sphere of interest, all right, perceptivity, just what's happening in your eyes, just what you perceive with your eyes. And that's his true subject of interest. That's what he's making everything out of. And it's the relationships of these things. Keep remembering that. So he's being dragged out of that to the consideration of subjective perceptions. In a few moments, his work, which up till then had given back convincing uh, uh, sensations of at least a few of the elementary facts of visual phenomenon, begins to dwindle, phenomena, begins to dwindle, fade away until he becomes discouraged and, and wild enough to put his foot through his canvas without being uh, aware of the real cause of his difficulty. 
Now, I wouldn't have to say more, but I'm going to read just a little bit more. Uh, you should be able to perceive what what we're talking about here. But this is the practice. This is the naive eye. This is the unthinking. You know, you got to be out of your mind to be a painter model. And for and the reasons you have, you're out of your mind is because the kinds of thoughts you're going to think are not connected to color, to value, to where they are and what they do, exclusively as they must be for you to re- maintain obje- objectivity. Say, for example, he's painting a portrait. Of necessity, he has begun his work objectively and carried it to where it automatically speaks about subjects and things. When this happens, he ceases unconsciously to be a craftsman. He becomes an ordinary observer and may say to himself, well, in this condition of subject, subjective perceptivity, that's subjection, right? This nose is too long. So we try to get people not to say no's. Gamble used to say the model, it used to say the model is just a potato. But even that is <laughs> maybe too much of a good thing, right? It's just a, it's just part of a field of color and values. Um, having forgotten, he may say this nose is too long, having forgotten that the perception of a nose as revealed from a flat surface is a controlled group of related tones and shapes, with which, as a craftsman, he should be solely concerned. Hand, uh, Head series. Oh, I'm sorry, he's showing something. Uh, by permitting this attention to stray in this way into the world of physical abstract physical abstractions, much of his energy has been diverted fruitlessly, and he sees his work developing into a hybrid collection of inaccurate statements on visual phenomenon, confused by his symbols, vicariously representing ideas on things. His work in this Sterile condition will confuse and depress him, and <laughs> it will take an act of courage on his part, and this is kind of key for all you guys who are sort of sorting out painting, to bring it back to a convincing state of depictive clarity. I, I say you have to learn to back off. You know, I use this Yosemite Sam, you know, the back of trucks. Sometimes you see that, that um, uh, guy, guy with the sombrero, two guns out, <laughs> says, back off. I've learned to, I had, I had to learn that. Never, never ever met with this guy. It's his ghost with the territory. I had to learn to back off until I was back in my right mind and not in this other place where of, of, of subjectivity where you, everything is a, you, has you thinking about the nose, the eyes, the ears, and the person, and the personality, and all those things. All right? Doesn't mean those things aren't on your mind, by the way, but I'm going to talk to you about how that works in a minute. Or in the next video, actually, probably. All right. Um, if, however, he can say to himself, noses be hanged, recognize and eliminate from his work all the symbols, now it becomes nose being a symbol he contains, he will soon bring it back to an encouraging state of depictive fecundity. So it will be available to you um, right away to get back to the, what's really getting you the truth, and that is the relationships of things visual, color, value, how big, where it is, how light, how dark, and what it does where it meets other values. So that, um, that, what I'm suggesting to you, uh, um, uh, this is music, is um, best practices for painting what's in front of you and, and getting the, the, the visual content in which, in which pool every single feeling sits, right? So if you're an impressionist, yes, you value the feelings, you value the you're trying to bring across that sense of beauty, that, that enough of the beauty so that other people could say, wow, responding to the same things you responded to. That's your job. But it can, it's contained in the visual uh, players, right, and the relationships of those. Uh, so that is a search after what, we, what he would call objective data, the truth of the relationships of objective data. I hope this isn't all too many big words, people. <laughs> when I was reading it to my students the other day. I was starting to laugh about these big, he's got to have four syllable words and more. But here, then he makes a lesson note further down in the book. He says, you tell me that your forehead, and this is just like a summary of it. You tell me your forehead looks too broad and you'll continue to find it difficult to cure this fault insofar as you describe it in words that anyone could, could use. The thing which you call a forehead is for you a disposition of a few controlled tones disposed in certain places on the surface of your canvas. Start using the words, and this is again, now this is the naming, right? Which concern your job. In this case, disposition of form and placement. These are the things we think about. These are the words we use. These are the pigs we have to name. Find out appropriate terms to speak to yourself and to others about pure objective factors. 
gather fresh data about them, lay them down, and the sense of a, of a uh, forehead of the right shape will come automatically. That's why I'm trying to tell you that my, my belief is the best practice is, all, is right there. That's the entire thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to leave it at that. And next week I'm going to talk about preconceiving. Somebody was asking me how to get angles right and not being able to, 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 to grasp them in his mind and his imagination well enough to put them down. I'm going to talk about preconceiving. But the importance of debriefing, I say, one of the reasons we work at, like Sargent did uh, with our painting alongside uh, the subject at roughly the same size, not not size size method, is because you can debrief yourself and see if your painting, and this would be also a way of Meldrum speaks of it, as is it if it's interchangeable with the thing next, does it feel like it's of a piece with this, no matter what three notes you have on there, just to begin the painting even. And your job, of course, to maintain the unity of the big impression. But we'll talk about all that stuff in the next one. But it's a, it, but it, it relates to this one. So I'm very pleased to, uh, and thank you very much. This is music for that. Uh, I dare not call you Tim. All right. Um, again, thank you, uh, Stephen and um, Ben. And uh, I will see you in the next one. Oh, oh, oops, oops. And don't forget. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe, to like, to share, and definitely make comments. I'm definitely needing comments these days to build videos on, so throw something at me. Um, I do have one back there where somebody wasn't happy with the way I, and said I denigrated Bougaro and Ang. I love Bougaro and Ang, so I'm, I, I hope that person will look back and look at that video again. I think I'd probably say right in the, in the video that I don't despise them. I'm telling you, well, I'd talk about this for us to show you the difference in what they're doing versus what the Boston School uh, and this kind of painting I'm talking about today is doing. So, but please do uh, give me comments. I have nothing to say. I don't know when we're going to do another another live one, but I, um, but we're looking, we're thinking. Meantime, have a great Fourth of July, you Americans, and and if you uh, are in other countries, read the uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence and the Independence in our Constitution if you want to find out what we're celebrating. If you haven't got any idea, and hopefully we can keep it as those of you seeing the struggles around us know understand. All right. Wishing you the best um, and see you next week.